good morning. My name is Fred Kemp. I'm president and CEO of the Atlantic Council. And it's a pleasure for me to uh, welcome you all to Atlantic Council front page or hashtag AC front page, our uh, uh, platform for global leaders. And we've had some of the most important leaders from all around the world on a regular basis uh, on this show. At the moment, we are confronted with challenges that are unlike any in recent memory with the COVID-19 pandemic, the worst uh, public health crisis of this sort in a century, already taking a half million lives in the United States alone, as well as the evolving and increasingly destructive effects of climate change. Here at the Atlantic Council, we know that these challenges, which are global in scope, can only be taken on with partners and allies. And thus, uh, our mission statement shaping the global future together. It is in that spirit that I would like to welcome our distinguished guests, uh, the Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley, Dr. Rowley, who is the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago and is currently the chair of the Caribbean community, otherwise known as CARICOM. Uh, Prime Minister Rowley is uh, serving in his second consecutive term as Trinidad and Tobago's Prime Minister. Prior to becoming prime minister, he was the governor of the Caribbean Development Bank and has held several cabinet level positions, including Minister of Planning and Development, Minister of Agriculture, Lands and Marine Resources, Minister of Housing, and Minister of Trade and Industry. In addition to his political career, Prime Minister Rowley obtained his doctorate in geology with a specialization in geochemistry and was formerly the head of the Seismic Research Unit at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. The Prime Minister is joining Atlantic Council front page today to speak on resetting U.S.-Caribbean relations on the heels of CARICOM's intercessional meeting. And we are happy to announce that this event will not only advance discussions on U.S.-Caribbean cooperation, but it will also simultaneously serve as the formal launch of programming for the Adrian Arsht Latin America Center's new Caribbean initiative. There's nothing else like it. We're very proud of this moment, Mr. Prime Minister, and very proud that you're sharing this launch, you're sharing this moment with us. The Caribbean initiative will focus on the strategic importance of the Caribbean based on shared interests, as well as from common values, ideas, and a strong and active US-based Caribbean diaspora. The initiative is just at the starting point for what we at the Atlantic Council hope is a new iteration in US-Caribbean relations. And in particular, a relationship that will remain a long and sustainable partnership. And that's what we do at the Atlantic Council is we take things on and then we take them on in a sustainable way over time. In that spirit, I would like to thank uh, in particular, Melanie Chen, a longtime personal friend, longtime member of our board who will close our show today for her vision in advancing this initiative. It literally would not exist without her. But then the Latin America Center wouldn't exist without the woman I'm going to introduce next. And that's Adrian Arsht, uh, the founder of the Adrian Arsht Latin America Center, as well as the Adrian Arsht Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center at the Atlantic Council, innovative, visionary, and results oriented. Uh, I'm also really delighted uh, that uh, we have with us uh, Vicky Acevedo. She is the inaugural fellow for this Caribbean initiative. Um, Melanie is in Antigua. Uh, Adrian is in Miami. Uh, Vicky is in uh, Trinidad, uh, as I understand, just a seven mile uh, swim from uh, uh, Venezuela. For those of you who want to instantaneously understand the geopolitical, geographic importance of what we're talking about today. Uh, as always, please join the conversation by using the hashtag AC front page or submit questions in the Q&A function if you are joining us via Zoom. I'm now going to pass the floor to Jason Marsak, the director of the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center, and he'll uh, bring us to the next segment of this important launch event uh, with uh, Prime Minister Rowley. Jason, over to you. Thank, thank you very much, Fred, and welcome, Prime Minister Rowley. Prime Minister, in the spirit of the importance of this day, I'd like to first turn to 
the new chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, Congressman Gregory Meeks, who, although he is tied up in votes and committee action currently, took the time to, to share some comments with you. So let's play first the, the chairman's comments. Good morning. It's a real pleasure to be part of this event, which will serve to launch the Atlantic Council's Caribbean Initiative. I also would like to extend my sincere greetings to Prime Minister Rowley. I want you to know, Mr. Prime Minister, that Congress looks forward to being a partner in helping your country and the broader CARICOM region that you represent to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. As regional neighbors, I strongly believe that working together, we can open a new chapter in the U.S.-Caribbean ties. A deeper and more resilient relationship is vital for our mutual long-term interests. I also want to commend the Atlantic Council for utilizing the Caribbean initiative to help further those ties in the years ahead. As all of you know, advancing the U.S.-Caribbean relationship and raising awareness of the strategic importance of the Caribbean here in Washington has long been a priority of mine. You see, my district in Queens is home to a vibrant and diverse Caribbean community, and I can see every day the many rich contributions they make. Throughout my career, I have and always will be a strong advocate for the Caribbean, especially during these challenging times. And today, while the COVID-19 pandemic has devastated the region's tourism, the current threat of climate change, it poses further threats to the Caribbean security and economic stability. And as chair, mitigating climate change and strengthening disaster resilience is one of my top priorities. And I will look forward to working with all nations to address this existential threat. I also look forward to elevating U.S. Caribbean shared opportunities and challenges before the full committee at the United States Congress and on my committee. In that spirit, my door is always open to you, Mr. Prime Minister, and all of your CARICOM colleagues. I'm a strong believer in multilateralism to address our shared global challenges, and I praise CARICOM for setting a great example of that. These relationships are not one-sided affairs, but are instead built upon mutual respect, understanding, and friendship. And so I look forward, as I'm sure the rest of the audience do well also, to listening to your remarks, but most importantly, engaging with you for the progress that we need to make so that we can move forward to make sure that tomorrow is better for our people than today and or yesterday. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much, Chairman Meeks. What an important message uh, that we can open a new chapter in US Caribbean ties by working together. With, with that being said, Prime Minister, in your time as CARICOM Chair, you were already tackling uh, major issues, addressing climate change. And most recently, you also spoke to the WTO Director General on behalf of CARICOM to articulate that I quote, the WHO must immediately convene an international convention on vaccine di distribution, end quote. This is an example, Prime Minister, of your leadership and how CARICOM as a 15 member regional body is leading the fight against inadequate vaccine distribution and also promoting advocacy on climate change issues. With that, Prime Minister, you've just left the intersessional meeting of the CARICOM heads of government where I'm sure there were intense discussions about COVID-19, climate change, and also expectations of the new Biden-Harris administration. I'd like to start off by giving you 10 minutes here at the outset to outline CARICOM's plans for 2021 and also what you meant when you declared this year as the year of CARICOM when you became the body's chair. Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Let me begin by recognizing Chairman Greg Meeks of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, the President and CEO, Board Directors, and members of the Atlantic Council, as well as the listening and viewing public. A very good morning to all of you. It is indeed a distinct pleasure to join you at this signal event today. This engagement could not be more timely with the recent installation of the new US administration and the conclusion yesterday 
of the 32nd Intersessional Meeting of the Conference of the Heads of Government of the Caribbean Community, CARICOM, which I have the honor to serve as its current chairman for the first half of this year. The United States has long been a very important neighbor to the Caribbean and continues to be a significant partner for a 16 million strong community in a number of areas, security, trade, investment, energy, agriculture, education, tourism, and of course, sport. Members of our diaspora have contributed meaningfully to the socioeconomic fabric of the United States in the fields of education, medicine, academia, the military, culture and the arts, to name but a few. A little known fact is that well before the United States became an independent nation, wealthy islanders from Barbados established a colony in what is now South Carolina in their quest to expand their agricultural land holding in the Americas. Today, one can still find their historical records and descendants there. So it can be said that we did colonize you before decolonization became fashionable. We all fought with you out of Trinidad when Fort Reed was one of the busiest allied airfields in World War II. And American sailors and Marines were drinking rum and Coca-Cola going down Point Kumana, naval base here in Trinidad before the Andrews sisters stole the haunting rhythm and those immortal lyrics. Constituents of CARICOM lineage can be found in New York, Florida, Georgia, Maryland, Washington, DC, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Texas, and as far as California. As a matter of fact, one will be hard pressed to find a West Indian household today, which does not have at least one family member or close relative domiciled somewhere in the United States many in the military, such is the bond that we hold. Distinguished United States citizens of CARICOM heritage have served and continue to serve at very high levels in the Congress and in general public administration. The record breaking honorable Vice President Kamala Harris, former Secretary, Secretary of State Colin Powell and former Attorney General Eric Holder have strong familial ties with Jamaica and Barbados. And the celebrated actor, choreographer, dancer, the iconic Jeffrey Holder brought to the lights of Broadway, the best of Trinidad and Tobago. One of the founding fathers of the United States, Alexander Hamilton was born in Nevis, now part of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis where his birthplace, the building, still stands as a shrine in recognition of America's deep roots in our idyllic islands. I cite these distinguished Americans and West Indians as some history to highlight the Caribbean, indeed CARICOM's nexus, which transcends the border reality and illustrates a natural partnership. Our prosperity redounds to your benefit and vice versa. In 1997, when President Bill Clinton met with Caribbean leaders in Barbados, both sides agreed on a partnership for prosperity and security. When CARICOM heads met with President George W. Bush in 2007, trade, economic growth and development, security, and social investment featured prominently. A year later, President Bush proclaimed June as Caribbean American Heritage Month, which serves as a platform to highlight the contributions of Caribbean people to America. CARICOM also welcomed President Barack Obama for the fifth summit of the Americas, which Trinidad and Tobago hosted in 2009 and which was attended by all the heads of state of, or government of the membership of the organization of the American states. 
curriculum also engaged President Joe Biden when he was vice president in 2013 on security, human development and energy matters in Trinidad and Tobago with subsequent encounters in Washington DC where we focused on energy. The Caribbean Basin Initiative, the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative, the Caribbean Energy Security Initiative still remain invaluable areas of collaboration and partnership. We are now in the era of the US Caribbean 2020 engagement strategy, a multi-year strategy to increase the security, prosperity, and well-being of the people of the United States and the Caribbean. It is to the credit of the drafters in a pre-COVID-19 era that the main tenets of the current blueprint for engagement are security, diplomacy, prosperity, energy, education, and of course, health. This juncture in time is an excellent opportunity to reset relationships between the United States and our region on these very issues. Equitable distribution of COVID-19 vaccines for CARICOM is our first order of business. And that is to ensure that as many of our citizens as possible are vaccinated as early as possible. This is fundamental to resuming social and economic activity across all spheres. The pandemic has spawned a crisis in health, closed our borders, crippled economic growth, and is creating a debt crisis that is unraveling noteworthy games made by CARICOM countries. Last month, the World Economic Forum cautioned that job creation is slowing while simultaneously job destruction is accelerating. We all have to fight against that and awaken the opportunities of the digital economy. Our region comprised of small island developing states, which we call SIDS, and those with low lying coastal areas is considered the most tourism and travel dependent globally. These are sectors that have been hard hit, almost decimated by the pandemic. As a community, the economic challenges reverberate throughout our single market. The tourism sector, which in some member states accounts for 50% of GDP, is a significant source of employment, revenue generation, and earns up to 60% in foreign exchange in some territories. It is also closely linked to food and beverage, the cultural industries, financial services, and issues of transportation. Some of us, like Trinidad and Tobago, have grappled with collapse and fluctuations in energy and commodity prices. Crude oil has dec declined in uh, price and volume by 23%. Natural gas is down by 2.9% in 2020. We have a high food import bill, which currently stands at 4.7 billion US dollars and increasing. And this impacts, we have the impacts of extreme weather systems, such as hurricanes and floods. Now these are real and present danger in the emergence of new variants of COVID-19, which may not be neutralized by the vaccines deployed to date. It is for this reason that the fair, transparent and equitable distribution of COVID-19 vaccines is critically urgent. We applaud President Biden's commitment to channel 4 billion US dollars to the COVAX facility in the next two years, and the G7 pledge of 4.3 billion US dollars to develop and distribute effective tests, treatments, and vaccines worldwide. We recognize that no country can be safe until every country is safe. CARICOM wants to work alongside the United States and other international partners within a robust multilateral framework to build back better together and ensure that no one is left behind. On February 17th, the United Nations General Secretary regretted that, and I quote, just 10 countries 
have administered 75% of all COVID-19 vaccines, while more than 130 countries have not received a single dose, unquote. We applaud his resolve to mobilize the entire United Nations apparatus in support of a global vaccination plan and to bring together all those with the required power, expertise and production capacities to achieve this outcome. We in CARICOM expect to receive our first doses sometime around mid-March. So far, all that we have received are 170,000 doses gifted to a couple nations from the government of India. Here, Barbados and Dominica, who received these gifts, graciously shared them around to many of us. This was done by them, even as others with millions of doses that they can't use immediately are refusing to make way for others at the manufacturer's shipping line. With respect to debt relief, vulnerability index, correspondent banking and general investment, CARICOM looks forward to working with the United States and other partners to navigate global economic challenges. The IMF estimated that the global economy has contracted 3.5% in 2020, and they have provided a somewhat optimistic but very uncertain global outlook for 2021. This is against the backdrop of the tremendous negative impact of the weakened economy on women, young people, the poor, the informal sector, and those in sectors with intense contact. The World Bank sees no abatement of development risks, with economic activity and incomes remaining low for a protracted period of time. Not surprisingly, the IMF's World Economic Outlook forecasts significant debt servicing problems for many developing countries as a result of the massive fiscal support provided during COVID-19. CARICOM is calling for global consideration of our peculiar circumstances and challenges. We believe the time is now for the use of a multidimensional vulnerability index for small island developing states, our SIDS, to supplement the current but inherently flawed criterion of GDP per capita as a measurement of development. As the region seeks to get back on track by 2030, sustainable, the goal, sustainable development goals are before us as targets and we call for the refinancing of COVID related debt and the postponement of debt servicing payments, comprehensive debt relief and appropriately priced funding to build economic and climate resilience. Concessional lending will also allow for expenditure on public infrastructure and training to support CARICOM's digital transformation and effective participation in the digital economy, as well as pursue investments critical for nutrition and food security and energy security. I appeal to the banking community, particularly in the United States, to desist from blacklisting and de-risking activities resulting in the withdrawal of correspondent banking services from our struggling member states. Severing of these services without acknowledging ongoing actions to comply with international standards is to cut off our proverbial oxygen supply. On behalf of CARICOM, in September 2019, I had encouraging discussions with Congresswoman Maxine Waters on this matter and were encouraged by her promise to have a hearing on this matter, but the COVID-19 got in the way. With respect to climate change, permit me to raise the issue which represents an existential threat to all of us in CARICOM. Let me first applaud President Biden and the US officially becoming as of last Friday, February 19th, a party to the Paris Agreement on climate change once again. Climate change is real, as evidenced by the hitherto inconceivable reality of a major hurricane flooding the New York subway, raging fires scorching the California landscape, leaving a path of death and destruction, and record-breaking low temperatures causing loss of life and collapse of infrastructure in Texas. 
We extend our sympathy to those who have lost loved ones and indeed also the loss of livelihoods. CARICOM empathizes having annual experiences of extreme climatic events wreaking havoc in our countries. We therefore continue to actively engage at the international level, providing guidance, scientific support and leadership on the climate issue. As the global community prepares for the 26th conference of the Paris COP26, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, CARICOM sees a golden opportunity to enhance our collaboration with the United States. The Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, the IPCC, a special report on global warming, indicates that emissions of greenhouse gases must be cut by 50% by 2030 to limit warming to below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Such action will barely protect our fragile ecosystems on which agriculture, fishing, and tourism depend heavily. Many of us have begun to seriously utilize and encourage low carbon and renewables to augment and direct our energy consumption into a more sustainable future. We hope to work together to urge all parties to enhance their national determined contributions, the NDCs, before COP26 in Glasgow in November to make attaining a 1.5 degree Celsius temperature change a reality. To do less is to put at risk our generation and generations of the future. On the way forward, the World Economic Forum declared, declared last month that, and I quote, no institution or individual alone can address economic, environmental, social, and technological challenges of our complex independent world, unquote. Cuba is Caribbean. Venezuela is Caribbean. We know the nature of the issues and the history of the challenges in both areas. However, we were very disappointed when the United States recently reversed the very welcome halting steps towards normalization of the relationship. And most recently, the announcement of the unconvincing designation of Cuba as a terrorist sponsoring state. We believe that this is one place where climate change would be welcome. We could all benefit from a significant thaw in the relationship between Cuba and the United States. As for the Venezuelan relationship, we would like to see a dispassionate early review of the United States scorched earth policy in this area. Since as the United Nations assessment confirmed what we always knew, and that is that the ineffective harsh policies of unilateral sanctions are contributing immensely to widespread additional indiscriminate human suffering in this Caribbean nation, which needs help. A compassionate ingredient, which is not beyond the United States leadership. We anxiously look forward to the United States playing that leadership role with CARICOM and the nations of Mexico and Norway to assist Venezuelans in solving their seemingly intractable political problems. The way forward in CARICOM's relationship with the United States is continued close collaboration and partnership on regional and international issues and a renewed commitment to pursue ardently the sustainable development of all our citizens. I thank you for your attention and I'd be pleased to entertain your questions and comments. Thank you once again. Right, Prime Minister Raleigh, thank you very much for that incredibly comprehensive overview. Uh, I'll, I'll assure you, Prime Minister, that many of the issues you outlined for the Caribbean are issues that we are uh, focused on and look forward to working with you and other CARICOM leaders. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I wanna begin by um, uh, turning it over to a couple of uh, participants uh, who have questions. And I'd like to begin with our senior fellow for our Caribbean initiative, uh, Vicky Acevedo. Uh, Vicky. Thank you, Jason. And good morning, Prime Minister. Good morning. Average, average energy costs in the Caribbean are about five times higher than in the United States. So energy security remains a high priority for the Caribbean as well as for the US government 
and the US private sector. I understand that certain deals between oil and gas companies, which would have used Venezuelan gas have been suspended due to sanctions. My question actually comes from Brian Butcher, senior advisor at Shell. He asks, what would you encourage the Biden administration to do as it evaluates the consequences of the Venezuela sanctions and what landmines would you warn them about? Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. And I think that's the most interesting and maybe the perfect question to start off this session. Um, and I speak here with, with both hats on, Trinidad and Tobago's hat and CARICOM chairman's hat, because Venezuela's relationship with the Caribbean and with the United States um, is so fundamental to our comfort and prosperity. Uh, it's interesting that this issue of energy, um, especially if we talk in the first instance of um, hydrocarbon energy, both there old one of oil and the new one of natural gas, is coming up when we're talking about Venezuela, the country with the largest known oil reserve in the world, and of course, Trinidad and Tobago, a country that started the first of the small LNG plants, um, which supplied the United States Eastern Seaboard for a while. It is interesting that um, very early in my tenure, we were able to get Venezuela to agree to do something which had not been done before, which is to export its gas. And all the arrangements were made, and that was very important to Trinidad and Tobago, because we haven't been in the gas business for so long. Our fields are becoming to be worn, and we are having greater and greater difficulties finding new gas supplies. And everything was in place to have Trinidad and Tobago tap for the international market and for its own benefit gas supplies in the close to our border with Venezuela and so on. But the sanctions on Venezuela have brought a halt to all of this. And what I would like to ask the new administration to do is to reset and give the dialogue a chance. Norway has encouraged that and so did Mexico. And the United States once again has the stature and the interest to bring the Venezuelan parties to a table with the support of CARICOM and other nations, read the riot act to everybody and agree as they've all agreed that Venezuelans must solve Venezuela's problem, not only in the interest of Venezuela, but in the interest of all of us who are codependents. So I will ask the administration to not be followed, not be overly, um, influenced by the dogmas of the recent past and the hawks of the recent flyings, but to look at it with a clean tabletop. And we are convinced that it is possible that some solutions can be had so that sanctions can be removed. And immediately, the sanctions that are increasing the hardships and are creating humanitarian crises for Venezuelans, as identified by the United Nations independent assessment that the United States be influenced by that. Thank you, Prime Minister. And I'll also assure you that the, here at the Atlanta Council, we've been working on Venezuela for quite some time and leading an international coordinated campaign to uh, have a human-centered approach on how to have a resolution to Venezuela's uh, de 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 political and also humanitarian crises. Uh, I'd like to take uh, two other, we have a question here uh, as well from uh, Francisco Palmieri. Francisco, uh, uh, served as the uh, Acting Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs. And I want to bring in Francisco's question, and then also Prime Minister bring in a question from Ambassador Sue Cobb uh, after Francisco's. But Francisco, please go ahead. Uh, good morning, Mr. Prime Minister. It's good to see you again. Good morning, Francisco. Um, as, uh, as you mentioned in your opening remarks and in a recent op-ed you co-authored with the Director General of the World Health Organization, You've argued that vaccine equity has become COVID-19's defining um, uh, issue. With this in mind and, and with the need for an increase uh, in vaccine distribution uh, to Caribbean countries, how do you see the role of various producer countries in providing vaccines 
and COVID-19 relief to the region. And given um, President Biden's um, uh, support uh, for the WHO and his commitment uh, to increase funding for global vaccine development, what more can the United States do? And why is it so uh, important for both CARICOM and the United States national interests to tackle this issue? Thank you. And Prime Minister, I'm gonna bring in a question in the interest of time as well uh, from Ambassador Sue Cobb, who's, who's, who's among other things has served as the US ambassador to Jamaica. Uh, ambassador Cobb? You're, you're on mute. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Uh, good morning, Prime Minister. Nice good to morning, see you. Good morning, Ambassador. Good to see you. Uh, I've been reading some uh, comments uh, that the current administration in the United States is paying some special attention uh, in the Latin American Caribbean region to the Northern Triangle, which uh, deserves some attention, of course. But I'm a little worried about the competition with the Caribbean. And I'm wondering what uh, individual countries, or maybe more likely uh, CARICOM, is doing to influence the IDB's new potential, could be next month, increase in capital for both the IDB and IDB Invest. Uh, are people paying attention to that and uh, lobbying and doing the things necessary to make sure that you all get a fair share? Thank you very much for your questions. Let me um, first take the question about COVID and what the U.S. can do to improve the circumstances. The United States, more than any other country, can change the, what's happening right now, and that is um, make sure that the plan that was worked out before we had a vaccine, that that plan, the COVAX mechanism, is made to work. All the pitfalls that we are in and facing now uh, were discussed before, were anticipated, and we sought to head it off by creating the COVAX mechanism, which was the global effort where all countries contributed financially to the research to get the answer as to what is the vaccine, where is the vaccine, and how it will work. But we knew from past history and from human behavior and the behavior of countries that it could have been possible that as if it was left as a free fall, that the strong ones would, would eat first and the weaker ones would starve to death. And those with funding available or those who were able to get into the door first would get it. And that was not the best way to treat with the virus. So the COVAX mechanism was and has been developed to allow us a, a major supply of whatever was available, a portion of it, to get into the COVAX mechanism. There was an equation by which there, would be, there is to be distribution to everybody, a portion of your immediate needs and your not so immediate needs. And over time, everybody would be vaccinated with the best response, putting up a wall to the virus. We held out great hope for that to work, but we were not naive that there would be um, inconsistencies and some questionable behavior. Unfortunately, what has happened and is happening is that the COVAX mechanism is not given the priority it should be given to cover particularly small and middle income countries. The larger, more powerful countries with more influential politics and um, fatter wallets are literally dominating the supply and distribution of what vaccines are available. The end result is that there is a serious shortage of vaccines as it is being produced. And what the United States could do, along with other major influential countries, is to ensure that whatever is available in whatever volume, that some of that gets to the COVID so that the, the COVAX, so that the COVAX mechanism can play its role in ensuring that the small and medium income countries will have, because the principle is that no one is safe unless everyone is safe. 
If you genuinely believe that, then everyone should have access to some vaccines. It is not biologically sensible to follow a principle where the wealthy ensure that they are completely inoculated. And when they are through, we will get what they've got left. If that is the direction that is gonna go on for the next few months, we run the very grave danger that the virus could do us a real return to damage by variants developing in countries like ours and others which have not been vaccinated. And then it would be the joke of the century if strong, wealthy countries try to inoculate themselves, discover that those who they ignored were the petri dish where variants occurred and those variants now make the vaccination that was done useless and we have to go and look for new vaccines again. So it's important to everybody that we deal with the virus across all nations so that the virus will not have the room to mutate and pose greater threats to us. And I am anticipating and I'm hoping that President Biden's team, I'm sure they'll be aware of what I've just said because they have the experts like we do. And biologically, we cannot fight this virus politically or financially. It has to be fought by the science and common sense of the science. And that is why it's important, especially for us here in the Caribbean, which is an extension of Key West going south, that we be viewed as an extension of the United States responsibility to take care of the health of the population within and on its borders. And the CARICOM and the United States, for COVID purposes, we are one and the same. The other question that was raised, that interesting question about what CARICOM is doing with respect to the financial environment, coming, that question coming from Jamaica's ambassador. We um, have been thinking and we are now working on jumping outside the box after we thought outside the box. What CARICOM is trying to do right now, only yesterday we took a decision that we want to develop and establish a CARICOM development fund. And we are hoping that those who offer to help us will somehow assist us in providing a guarantee base for this CARICOM development fund, which will generate a return, which will, which will be sufficiently attractive to mobilize resources within the region, resources which are now earning very small returns, but which will move to this fund if the fund properly secured and guaranteed by our friends, both at home and abroad, cause it local regional investors to bring their idle capital to this fund for the return that would be offered to them. And that will create a pool of money for development for CARICOM nations. Because what has happened like in Trinidad and Tobago and many of our other countries, what little monies we had earmarked for a development program because of the demand of the COVID-19 for sustenance and defense of the human population from a humanitarian standpoint, we have had to use up all that de development capacity and the debt that we incurred, if only to fight the virus to stay alive. So we are now virtually without any wiggle room to find even to borrow funds for a development program. So this CARICOM development fund that um, Prime Minister Motley and myself and the CARICOM, we're pushing, we are hoping that those who are listening to us now and friends who are better off than we are, would see this as the best way to help the region now to help us provide a secure basis to kick off this CARICOM development fund. And then we will come to the table to you and say, because of the existence of this fund, from our own efforts, we have raised a certain amount of money and we are asking you now to help us increase that pot so that we can have development in the Caribbean. And from, from that, we see great sustenance going forward because it's a system that can work and let us make the most of what resources we have and encourage you to help us do more with what little we have and what you can contribute to international development in the region. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much. And, and, and especially thank you for those uh, very thoughtful, articulate uh, mess, uh, words and message about COVID and, and the importance of equitable vaccine distribution. Uh, many of these issues you've laid out are issues that uh, we look forward to working with you and other CARICOM leaders on. Uh, I'd like to now turn it over to 
Uh, Melanie Chen, uh, who is an Atlantic Council board member, uh, will always remind me that she is the only Atlantic Council board member of Caribbean uh, uh, heritage and uh, also is the intellectual inspiration behind the Caribbean initiative that we are launching to you today. Over to you, Melanie. Thank you, Jason. I am indeed the only board director of the Atlantic Council born in the Caribbean. And I am pleased- Mel Melanie, you have, some, you have some competition now because Vicky is uh, an honorary, more than honorary <laughs> Trinidadian because she has the, probably the recipe for the best chocolate Trinidad chocolate tea. <laughs> if you haven't tried that yet, you must. I will. So I'm pleased that the programming of the Caribbean Initiative has been formally launched with such a stimulating AC front page event. We have high aspirations that this work will help usher in a new era of US Caribbean relations marked by renewed respect and trust. By listening to leaders like you, Prime Minister Rowley, and to have had Chairman Meeks reinforce his commitment to US Caribbean relations and our new Caribbean initiative, we can begin to attract the talent and energy necessary to fashion mutually beneficial solutions for prosperity and security in our hemisphere. Prime Minister Rowley, I want to thank you again for your time and insights. Your thoughtful answers to the questions during this conversation all go well for the Caribbean Initiative. Several areas of alignment have emerged, climate change, financial inclusion, and economic recovery, including things like the vulnerability index and equitable vaccine distribution. Other issues like Cuba, Venezuela, sanctions were discussed constructively and therefore offer excellent new opportunities for cooperation. These are all issues that need work and we will be addressing throughout this year as we prepare for the launch of our US Caribbean Consultative Group, our Financial Inclusion Task Force, um, which is going to discuss things like the Correspondent Banking and the Vulnerability Index, and other efforts, including a marquee forum with Yale University next month on Caribbean sustainability. Thank you all for joining us today. I invite you to join us in this work of developing policies that lay firm foundations for our interactions in shaping a future of shared well being. Please stay tuned and visit our website for the three AC front page events next week featuring US Senator. Dan Sullivan, YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki, and Nobel Laureate Malala Yousafzai. Thank you.